This next presentation. By the way, don't forget to scan the QR code for the attendance for this session. Uh, here's the QR code on the in front. We will go to the third presentation because the second presentation is not around. So, Dr. Leroy Tim Ruhupati and Dr. Jimmy Kijai. Uh, they are going to present their paper, Development of an Intention of Tight Scale, or ITS. Dr. Riloy Tim Ruhupati is the chairperson for the Business Department and Associate Professor of Financial Accounting at the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies. And Dr. Jimmy Kijai is the Interim Director for the Asia Pacific Research Center and Professor of Research and Statistics at the Graduate School Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies. Let us uh, give them time to present their paper. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for giving us the chance to uh, present. As you can see, uh, there are three co-authors here, myself, Dr. Kijai, and Lal Ram Parmawi. She's actually our uh, MBA research student who uh, did the research on, um, on uh, tithing intention. And so we'd like to share with you what, uh, what we did. Uh, first of all, why, why tithe? Uh, at IAS, our strategy on research is uh, to focus our research agenda on research that supports the church mission. Uh, for so long, we've been somewhat focusing more into uh, knowledge, etc. But we would like it to be uh, to crossroad with our church mission, and so there will be more and more research at IAS that is actually um, in line with how can we support the church in conducting its mission. So decision making will be more data driven and research driven. So <clears throat> then, oh, why why tithe? Since 1930. Uh, the orange uh, curve represents tithe as source of income for the church. In 1930, about 54% of the church income comes from tithe. In 2022, last year, it has gone up to about 72, 73%. So you see that the church is becoming more and more reliant on tithe as source of income. Uh, the problem is Back in 1965, about 72 or 74% of church members tithe. But in 2000, and when was that, Dr. Kijay? 2000 and, in 2012. That was the last data, that was the last research done. Only about 30% of church members tithe. So you see the, the, you see the problem that our church is facing. We are becoming more and more reliant on tithe but the percentage of church member tithing has gone down from about 72% down to about 30% in 2012. We are becoming more reliant on tithe, but there are less church members who tithe. So there's a problem there. So then the question is how can we improve the situation? How can we, how can we slow down or even reverse the declining trend in church members that tithe? We need to do that because we are becoming more and more reliant on tithe. But how can we do that if we, we do not understand uh, you know, the dimensions of intention to tithe? You know? And uh, we're, we're, we've actually finished another study where we look at what are the factors that influence tithing intention and eventually tithing behavior. But that's for another, uh, another uh, session. For now, we would like to know first uh, what are the dimensions of intention to tithe. So once we understand that, then we can apply that, use that in a broader study of how to improve tithing. Uh, so far, we looked into the literatures. Uh, there is a lack of literature that look into the dimensions of tithing intention. Um, there is one study on uh, intention uh, to donate. It is unidimensional. They use us, uh, there are only two questions uh, in relation to intention, uh, only two question items. 
uh, it's unidimensional and uh, I don't think it captures enough the dimensions of intention to tithe. And so because of that, uh, we went on and developed this, we went on the following procedures. Uh, I have some literatures that later on we can discuss if you would like to. But we, we reviewed literatures, we identified salient factors, we talked to experts uh, from the applied theology department, so we went through the process of ensuring the uh, content validity of the instrument, and then we, of course, get ERB approval, and then we do, did two pilot tests uh, with that instrument. Uh, the third pilot test is done in the Philippines with 155 um, church members, and then we use principal component analysis for that, and from there, we went on and applied and, and did another uh, pilot test in Indonesia uh, with a group of 406 uh, church members, and then we did a confirmatory factor analysis on that to be able to uh, come up with a reliable uh, tithing scale. Uh, very quickly, here are the questions that we tested. Uh, I will just go very quickly with this. Uh, the first one, uh, intention to set aside tithe, uh, from my income before I spend it. Uh, and you can see there some of the sources, how we developed that question item, why did we include that. Uh, another is I plan to give tithe faithfully, so really this captures the spiritual commitment element. Uh, and you can see that the church members scored them pretty highly. This is out of a four, uh, four uh, like a scale. Yeah, one out of four. So they scored pretty highly there. Uh, prioritizing in overall financial planning and budgeting. Also, I am confident that I can maintain my intention to tithe even when I'm in financial difficulties. So even in financial distress, they can prioritize and is confident that they can be faithful with tithing. Um, I intend to give one-tenth of my income as tithe regularly. Yes, again, it shows commitment there. But if you're going to see, the last four questions is more on the uh, negative side. I would return tithe when, so there's an if element there. I would return the tithe after I settle my debts. Um, I would give tithe if I had someone to remind me. Uh, and very interestingly, MacIver in, in 2015 came up with a worldwide um, a study on motivity or what motivates tithing. Uh, actually, they looked, or he actually looked into a group of Seventh-day Adventists across four continents. Uh, Australia, um, Africa, the U.S., and, uh, and South America, and, so, and North America and South America. Uh, they were able to identify some church member who partially tithe or do not tithe at all. And then they asked the question, uh, what would have to change for you to tithe, to fully tithe? What would have to change for you to fully tithe? You know, one, the top answer was, I would tithe regularly if someone <laughs> reminds me to. <laughs> and that, that is why this question is here. You know. uh, another is, I would tithe uh, more faithfully if uh, the worship is changed. <laughs> Something like that. I have, the, I have the, the report with me. But anyway, so these are some of the questions. Now I'm going to uh, allow my, my colleague, Dr. Jimmy Kijai, to go on and show you the process of how we develop the tithing instrument. And then later on, we will show you the implication of this. Thank you. So initially, we developed a pool of items. Uh, I don't remember. I think we had like 15 or 16 items to begin with. And then we had a panel of experts to look at these items in terms of relevancy. And uh, from the result of these expert judgment, we came up with nine. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we look at this, and we said, Question number nine, which is seven to six, I don't see the necessity of tithing. Uh, we didn't think that was a measure of intention, even though it was, uh, there was a general agreement amongst the experts that it is. So we considered that more of an attitude rather than intention. So we excluded that item in our uh, analyses. So we have an eight item um, scale. <clears throat> Um, so what we did was, uh, once we got the, the, um, the data, 
we did a series of exploratory fact analyses. <clears throat> we started with principal component analysis, PCA, with Verimax rotation, orthogonal rotation. Uh, we did um, uh, exploratory fact analyses using uh, um, maximum likelihood with orthogonal as well as oblique rotation. And actually, it turned out that the simplest solution was the principal component analysis with um, oblique rotation. <clears throat> so these are actually the pattern loadings. And it came out uh, with two factors, two of two factor solutions. And if you look at these two factor solutions, uh, the first factor, if you look at the items, those actually, when you look at these items, uh, will prioritize tithing in my overall financial planning Confident can maintain my intention to tithe. I intend to set aside my tithe from my income before I spend it. Uh, I intend to give one tenth. So if you look at these, we decided to call this as uh, intrinsic intention. In other words, these are internalized characteristics uh, or attitudes or yeah, intention to tithe. So these are intrinsic. And most likely, people with intrinsic uh, intention are more likely to actually tithe. And then the second factor we have is what we call as conditional um, <clears throat> intention. So if you look at these items, uh, would give tithe if reminded, um, return tithe after I settle my debts, return tithe when I earn a living, I don't see necessity of tithing. It's, it's included there. It actually has a fairly good loading, <laughs> but it is, uh, so we decided that. Uh, so in our subsequent analysis, we excluded that item. So, so in this pilot study, uh, we came up with a two-factor uh, intention, uh, intention to tithe scale. So what we did then is to actually validate this model uh, in the Indonesian context. So we administered the questionnaire. Uh, let's see. We're going to go back here. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, go back. Right there. Just this one. <coughs> so what we did was... Um, who administers um, the questionnaire. The question itself actually had many variables, but in this particular analysis, we only look at the uh, intention to tie things. <clears throat> so we, uh, we collected the data and we perform a confirmatory fact analysis as a way of, as a way of validating what we found in study one. And it actually fitted perfectly. It actually fitted perfectly. So here is the path. Here is the CFA, the measurement model of the intention to scale, intention to tie scale. Um, so you look at the loadings now here in, in the conditional um, variable, latent variable, we excluded the, um, I don't see the necessity to tie. Um, so you look at the uh, path, you know, the pattern loadings, it actually, those are really good. Um, you notice that uh, intrinsic intention and conditional intention are negatively correlated, which kind of makes sense, right? If you are intrinsically motivated to tithe, very likely you are going to um, have lower conditional intention. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So here are the fit indices. Um, and like I say, without any modification, uh, the model fits almost perfectly. Um, you know, the chi square divided by degrees of freedom is less than three. Um, and the fit indices, the norm fit index. Um, Comparative fit index, uh, they're all above 0.95. RMCA is uh, 0.06, which is right on the bubble. 
and then SRMCR, the standardized uh, residuals, um, it's 0.03. So uh, we think that uh, we've created an instrument that has a lot of promises. Uh, the next thing that we intend to do is to try collect data from different parts of the world and see if we can um, validate the same model. Um, and I think we have, uh, I think this uh, um, scale has promises for gauging possible um, behavior of church members because if you, if you see a lot more people that have intrinsic intention, they are more likely to give tithe and I think that has uh, implication for budgeting and, and things of that sort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kijay. So, you know, the implication of, of uh, the finding is that we can actually use this scale to measure the intention of tithing of our church members. Yeah, so if you would like to know Okay, what are the factors that are influencing the intention to tithe? Because uh, the theory of planned behavior said intention to tithe has very strong correlation to tithing behavior, the actual tithing, the actual act of tithing. So really with the tithing, good tithing intention, if we understand the tithing intention of our church members, then we'll be able to use that and see what other factors are influencing the intention to tithe. You see, we're bringing, I'm bringing this back to the problem that we have is that our church members, the proportion of our church members who tithe are, are dropping. And so really we need to improve that. If we know how to measure their intention to tithe, then now we can, we can bring that up and use that in studies to find out what are the factors that will uh, influence their, uh, <clears throat> their intention to tithe. Yeah, so um, I think what is uh, interesting is that you can see the negative correlation between the intrinsic intention to tithe and condition, uh, conditional in, uh, intention. Uh, it, it, mean, it means that uh, our church members have good intrinsic intention to tithe and low conditional intention to tithe, and you can see the mean. So I think that is good. Uh, it is good, but now we need to know what are the factors that are affecting uh, this intention to tithe? So anyway, um, thank you for that. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for the interesting presentation. Do you have some questions? Just one or two questions? Okay, yes. Pastor Domokmat. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, you know, this questionnaire was based on 155 uh, a sample in the Philippines and 406 in, in Indonesia. What we would like to do is actually have a, a more sample to validate it. Uh, the Philippine data are based on people who live around Ayas. What we would like to do is really we would like to approach our union, our, our conference uh, friends, and see if we can replicate this across the Philippines and find more valid uh, results. But yes, you know, we'll be very happy because at the end of the day, we develop things like that and then we just keep it as, as a report somewhere, no use, you know. So yes, we'd be very happy to share it. We'd be very happy to share the questionnaire with you. The only request we have is, would you be willing to share the data with us so that we can... <coughs> Okay, one more. I think. Uh, okay, Pastor uh, Enrique. Uh, what we have in the Philippines is the church compliance progress of the stewardship department of the FDH. And it's the requirement that uh, everyone who wants to get ordained has to pass to it. <laughs> they need to determine whether the pastor are able to increase higher. Or they will be set aside for ordination. If they're able to know how to increase the financial contribution, but if 
much more empirical than what we, we, we usually do. But if you could collaborate this research that you've done with the rest of what we're doing here in the NBUC, then we will come up with something more uh, a research-based uh, study for the increase of uh, isolation. Okay, there's a response. Um, in a follow-up study that Leroy and I have done, you know, one of the biggest predictors, one of the best predictor of um, tithing intention and tithing behavior is trust on church leadership. This is the result of the... Yep. Of a, in your survey or a general... In, in, the serve, in, 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 a, in the survey, in the study that uh, we did in the Indonesian group, Okay. Um, and even in the Philippine, small Philippine group, one of the best predictors of tithing intention and behavior is trust on church leadership. Local and, uh, yes, at least, the two, at least the two sets of data that we have collected. Yeah. Okay, last. <laughs> Very good question. But again, you know, uh, my answer to your question is uh, outside the scope of this research. <laughs> but, but, you know, that's a very good question. The, the follow-up research that we did, so I'm just going to follow up with what uh, Dr. Jimmy said. Trust is one key factor, but trust has three dimensions. Uh, trust that the church leaders has benevolence. Benevolence means the uh, the intention of well-being for the church members. Second, that they are honest. And third, that they are they have capability. Now, <clears throat> that alone is mind-boggling because during the COVID-19, etc., when the church members are having difficulty, where are the church leaders? What did the church leaders do? Did they do they show well uh, well intention for the church members? Number two, in integrity, we have questions such as uh, the lifestyle of the church leaders uh, agree with what they teach. And the church leaders uh, uh, make decisions for the interest of the church members. But I mean, those are just some, some, some of the items. And what it is saying is that the church members are looking at the church leaders. And they develop trust. If they trust, then they will eventually uh, tithe. Uh, one factor leading to trust is financial accountability. <laughs> Use of church assets and the accountability of those church assets. If we fail there, we fail trust, we fail tithing. So I mean those are just, but it's just, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> We have, that, we have that research. We will be presenting it in IS conference in, in November. Okay, it's already time. But, uh, okay, sige. Pagbigyan ko po si Pastor. That is a very good question. Uh, but in our model, in our model, you know, trust and attitude leads to spiritual commitment. And spiritual commitment has 80% influence on intention to tithe. So really, perhaps economic condition could have maybe 20% or 30% impact, but spiritual commitment has very strong. And that's why in the intention to tithe question items, you see that I think the four or five questions represents faith. Faithfulness, spiritual commitment. So I believe uh, economic condition of church members will have very little to do with tithing if spiritual commitment is strong. Now the problem with our, with our stewardship uh, program is we go and we promote uh, faithfulness to tithe, but they've been already faithful with whatever they have. 
right? If I make 1,000 pesos, I'll be faithful with my 1,000 pesos. The problem is how can we improve their commitment so that they can be faithful with 1,000 or 1 million? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. The host uh, would like to up, uh, give the appreciation by presenting to Dr. Dr. Leroy. Uh, may I invite Dr. Jimmy Kijai to receive the certificate of presentation uh, for this oral presentation entitled Development of an Intention to Tight Scale. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, uh, we will now go to the next presenter. And uh, the next presenter is the one of the most important person here <laughs> uh, at the AUP, Dr. Jali S. Balila, with the co-author of her husband, Dr. Edwin Balila. They are, are going to present a paper that is entitled Effects of Adventist Education Experience and Attitude on Spiritual Well-Being Among Seventh-day Adventists in the Southern Asia-Pacific Division, mediated by religious activity engagement. Dr. Jali Balila is the research director of, of, at the Adventist University of the Philippines. She also serves as a methodologist and statistician at the university, she conducted training and published studies using quantitative and qualitative methodologies. She teaches and mentors undergrad and graduate students, students in research and statistics and has a strong passion for sharing knowledge and fostering a love for learning among students and faculty at AUP. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I'm going to present a study which I think we did not gather the data. It was actually the study con uh, gathered by the team of Dr. Rosario uh, on um, church members global survey, Seventh Day Adventist. No? Uh, yeah, for yeah for SSD. So we actually um, work with the data. Um, so. The title is Effects of Adventist Education Experience and Attitude of Church Mem Leaders, Church Leaders and Members on Spiritual Well-Being Among Seventh-day Adventists uh, in Southern Asia Pacific, mediated by uh, religious activity. So we, we just did a summary. So we all know that uh, we Seventh-day Adventists uh, believe that we have already a very high or high spiritual well-being knowing that we are Seventh-day Adventists. But we were not able to find records on that. Um, the result, maybe this is the reason why they conducted the study. So we have these variables, uh, the uh, Adventist education experience, the re uh, re religious activity engagement, and um, the attitude. When I say attitude, it's the attitude of, of pastors, that includes pastors, church leaders, and members to a church member. So that's how the, the, the items are actually um, defined uh, under attitude. So I'll go direct to the result. Uh, we were looking for studies on this, but we were not able to find. So we tried to connect these variables uh, statistically uh, trying to find out what what can improve our our spiritual well-being. So we have these variables in the questionnaire, in the survey questionnaire. We have uh, Adventist education experience, uh, activity, religious activity engagement. So 
that thus the study was conceptualized. So we, the, the methods of study, I use cross-sectional or descriptive correlational design, uh, which include Seventh-day Adventists. No? Seventh-day Adventists gathered um, around 5,672. We actually cleaned the data because in that data there are so, there are so many blanks. No? They did not answer. So uh, the reason why we have retained the 5,672. And it was represented by 12 different countries. Now you can see the, the different countries now in, in SSD. And in the collection of data, we, they used the SDA Global Church Member Survey questionnaires. And uh, they, I think this, uh, the questionnaires were content validated. And uh, with that uh, variables, it has 20 items for Adventist education experience. And for the attitude, we have eight items. For the spiritual well-being, we have eight items also. For the religious activity engagement, 18 items. Okay, uh, yeah. So uh, the, the profile of the, the participants or the respondents of the study, uh, we have male and female, so almost uh, equal. And um, there are those who did not declare their, their sex while well, orientation. And uh, let me see, 10.9% of them were employed in the past by the SDA Church. 20.2% SDA Church. were employed. 68.8% were not employed by our SDA Church. And the 2.4% did not indicate their employment. So uh, in... In terms of their um, marital status, of course, they were married, 48.3%, single, divorced, separated, widowed, and there, are, there were those who are also living together. No, or you cannot deny the fact that we have seven Adventists living together, uh, not married. So yeah, at least we know that we can reach out if we know somebody. Okay, now for the results, um, we have there the, the descriptive results. When it, at least we know, um, we have the data that the, the Adventist education experience were rated good by these Seventh-day Adventist church members. And uh, the attitude of, of uh, the church leaders and members were rated also good by, by these respondents. But in terms of religious engagement, uh, they, they said that it's only moderate, which means they, they, they were engaged in religious activities once a month. So I think uh, these things this needs to be improved you know, once a month. Because uh, uh, especially in, if, we are, if we belong to a big church, you know, it is very, uh, the, the involvement in church activities now we're, I think, lower compared to when we are in the small churches. Now, for the spiritual well-being, at least we know that the, the spiritual well-being of our church members are considered high. You no, know, it's considered high. Okay? Now, well, we try to connect you know, this... So, wait first. Uh, this uh, variables, and we found out that the, there is a positive relationship with, between Adventist education experience and the spiritual well-being attitude. The attitude that I mentioned is also positively correlated and the religious activity. So that's singling you know, one by one. Now, uh, when we collectively, you know, as a whole, uh, we, we use multiple regression to determine if this uh, variables are significant predictors, and we found out that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we found out that uh, all these variables that we we used in the study were uh, positively or significantly predictors of spiritual well-being. So, which means that although there are malit lang small percentage of variance accounted for, uh, we know that this. These three factors are significant predictors to improve the spiritual well-being of our um, church members. So take note, we have to improve our religious activities engagement, 
we have to have a better education, Adventist education experience, and um, what else? Religious activities. Yeah, we have to engage our our church members in these religious activities so that the spiritual well-being will also improve, be improved. Okay, so we also looked into the mediating effects of the uh, religious activity engagement. And uh, we can see there the, wait first, here. Uh, we can see there the result of the, mod, the model, uh, the result of the vegetation analysis. And uh, what do you think is the role of uh, religious activity engagement? So when we connect this, these variables, no, um, using making religious activity engagement as the mediator, it partially mediates. And I think Sir Balila, being my co-author, will be the one to explain uh, the partial mediation. Uh, yeah, why, why partially mediation? Because we have the full mediation, but this time the result is partially mediation. There is also a direct, an indirect effect of uh, the, ind the independent variables to the spiritual well-being. So if you can see the, the line there, they're all significant, but the relationship is, is uh, the, the mediation is only partial. Okay, can you comment wha what's the meaning of partial for your contribution? It is partial if the effect of this independent variable, this time attitude of church leaders and members, is significantly relating spiritual well-being. That's partial. Because this mediation is partially mediating the effect of this because this is significant. If this will not be significant, the role of this mediation is full. Is you have before this attitude of church leaders and members will have an effect on spiritual well-being, it has to pass through religious activities. That's why it's full. But this time, the direct effect of this variable on this variable is significant. That's why it is partial. The same is true with the other one. Okay, so as we can see that um, it, it directly and indirectly if, uh, affect the, 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 the Adventist education engagement is directly and indirectly if affect the spiritual well-being. So with the attitude um, and the attitude of the church leaders and members. So uh, being a church members and pastors, I think we know what to, to do and uh, for the recommendation that we have to improve these uh, variables that we have uh, looked into so that uh, I think the spiritual well-being will uh, be improved also among church members. Okay, so, so I have given you the results. In Philippians 4, 6-7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds with, in, in Christ Jesus. So I think uh, we have our role, being the church members, uh, to, our, to our brethren. So it's not only the church leaders, but also the, the church members can work together to have a harmonious uh, relationship. So it's something to do with relationship. Um, the, the engagement, the education also, uh, uh, Adventist education experience, and also the, uh, the attitude. No? So, so thank you so much. If you have some questions. Uh, we, okay. Okay, doctor. Um, 
in in doing regression, I think there's a very small amount of variance accounted for. Uh, there are maybe other variables were not studied yet. So with this, I think only eight percent with a big number of um, respondents. Because, yeah. mm -hmm. because with so many, with 5,000 cases, even with small cooperations, um, you can very 10 point, find 10.2 percent. Yeah. Uh, the biggest uh, contribution from the three variables is for the Adventist education experience. That's a that has the highest, the highest, the highest uh, variance accounted for. So I think we have also to improve our education. <laughs> uh, Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, it, would, it would be interesting to see how this model compares in some other division. Because we have the data. Yeah. yeah, so this is what we have, we get from the data, from the research. And it's nice also to, to do some analysis because um, there are, there are many things that we can do with the data. That question, really, is very, that question, as far as statistics is concerned, is very important. Because uh, the tendency of correlation, regression, when there are a lot of data, even for a correlation of 0.175, something like that, it will, be, it will become significant. Yeah, that's why it's important to square it to find out really the contribution. I hope you understand. <laughs> okay, Doc. Okay, Dr. Thank you. I, I think what your finding tells us that Adventist education is important, uh, even, if, even if the rest, because uh, your finding shows that uh, religious engagement partially mediates Adventist education experience as well, right? Let's say, let's say that partial mediation is flawed because of the huge number of sample. Let's say even if that's true. I'm not saying that is true, but let's say even if that's true. What this is saying is that Adventist education experience have strong effect on spiritual well-being. So I think as, as church workers, as members, I think this is a call for us to really pay attention to our, our Adventist education system because their experience in our schools determines their spiritual well-being. And spiritual well-being will uh, very much influence whether the person stays in church or not. So I think uh, we need to pay more attention on Adventist education. Thank you. Yeah, that one. You will see that the direct effect uh, is only 0 0.053, which is significant already. But actually, uh, if, there, if, the, if the number of respondents were just few, it would have been full. Yeah. You are right when you said religious activity engagement is really very important because that will explain the effect of these two independent variables. So to, to, to give you another example for a full and partial mediation is like this. In the Bible, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So that's full mediation. Why full? Because when we direct ourselves to God, according to the Bible again, our righteousness is just like a filthy rag in the sight of God. So our relationship to God is fully mediated by Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Do we have one more? Do we have time for one more? Okay. Because uh, uh, we don't have one uh, presenter. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I just wanted to uh, appreciate the model. But I would, also want, I, would also, I would also request the presenters to probably give us an idea of how they came up with the model. You see, my, in my limited understanding of mediated models, sometimes it's easy for us to put in together models that don't make sense. Now that you have the data, can you give us an idea of how you came up with the model, you know, how you looked at temporal relationships between 
between these uh, these these factors. I think it would help all of us here, those of us who are beginning uh, researchers, for us to 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 you know how how we can how we can build more uh, models that that make sense, not only mathematically but also uh, in in real life. Thank you. the theories or the literature that there is connection between the academic uh, education experience and spiritual well-being, uh, attitude of church members and well-being. And uh, practically, we, hope, we observe that, right? We observe that. And we are still looking, uh, but uh, very few uh, published studies, especially among Seventh-day Adventists. Wala eh. That's the reason why we, there is a need to conduct more research on this because we don't have a model of our own that are saying that this is connected. Uh, we are trying our best to look for this, but there are, there are related uh, literature, there are li literature. But for, for the Seventh-day Adventists, we don't have, actually. It should be based, should be originally, you know, when we, when we do research and do some connections, it should be based on literature, yeah. A study like structural equation modeling, mediation, yeah, yeah, mediation analysis, the nature is is um, more open than that. It is confirmatory in nature, so we really need literature and theories to come up with this. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we would like to give this certificate of presentation. I would like to do ask uh, Dr. Edwin. Okay, we want to give this uh, certificate of presentation given to the husband and wife. Uh, there's only one presentation, by the way, but the husband and wife, according to the Bible, is one, are one. Okay, so they have only one. So we would like, okay. Okay. Okay, I think you are still awake. Thank you. Uh, we come to the final presentation. The last but not the least. Uh, we have a presenter coming from Asia Pacific International University. His name is uh, Dalza Kapp, an intern chaplain at Asia Pacific International University. He's currently pursuing a Master of Education degree following his undergraduate studies in religious studies. His research focuses on the comprehensive overview and analysis of interpretations surrounding the concept of eternal punishment in Matthew 25, verse 46. The time is given to you. Thank you so much. Once again, good afternoon, scholars. Thank you for joining me today. As you have heard, my name is Dal Zakap, and I am very delighted to address you today with a topic of theological significance, the debate over eternal punishment in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, a comprehensive overview and analysis of interpretations. <laughs> And I'd like to begin by reading the, con the passage under consideration. Matthew chapter 25, verse 6, it says, Then they, that is the unrighteous, will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The phrase or the concept 
of eternal punishment here in this verse has sparked intense debate among theologians and scholars throughout the Christian history and with each viewpoint exerting a profound influence on the Christian doctrine. So I think it is very important that we undertake a thorough study to understand the meaning of eternal punishment and to examine the theological viewpoints that have, that have been emerged in response to this verse. So in this presentation, we will delve into the, this ongoing theological debate, investigating whether this punishment, eternal punishment, entails everlasting suffering or a complete alienation of the wicked or the reconciliation of all people with God. And to obtain, to achieve this, this objective, our study employs a qualitative research methods, gathering and analyzing data from various sources such as scholarly literatures, theological texts, and Bible commentaries. And through thematic analysis, I categorize the diverse interpretations into three main viewpoints, traditionalism, uh, conditionalism, and universalism. And then each viewpoint is then evaluated through the lens of biblical evidence and a brief exegesis study focusing on the word Ionian will be conducted to determine which viewpoint uh, aligns most in consistently with the teaching of the Bible. So let us start with a traditionalism. Traditionalism advocated by prominent theologians suggests that eternal punishment entails un unceasing conscious torment in hell. This view was, uh, emphasizes the everlasting on the unending continuous suffering of the wicked. And let us evaluate this viewpoint in light of the Bible. First, let us keep in mind that this interpretation relies on deductive reasoning rather than inductive analysis of the biblical text. And the deductive arguments can be summarized as follows, as you can see on the screen. It, it basically, the deductive argument argues that since God is eternal, and his judgment is not bound by time, then the consequence of that punishment, judgment, namely eternal punishment, must also be timeless or everlasting. However, a careful examination of the relevant biblical passages uh, that, that discuss the, weak, the fate of the wicked, including their, their perishing, Malachi chapter, one verse, chapter 4, verse 1, all their destruction, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, all their experiencing a second death in Revelation chapter 20. These passages suggest otherwise. It suggests that the wicked will face or will be ultimately destroyed and cease to exist rather than experiencing eternal suffering in hell. Second, the Condition that I mean the traditionalist belief in eternal conscience is rooted in the idea of immortal soul. They argue that human being possesses an immortal immortality or immortal soul or spirit that continues to exist after death, and therefore resulting in eternal punishment of the wicked. However, let us this. Teaching is not based on the Bible, but rather on the dualistic view of human nature found in the Greek philosophy that, that consider hum, the human body as temporal and corruptible and the soul as divine and, and immortal. And second, and, and moreover, the biblical view of human nature suggests that only God possesses there's an immortality, and that immortality is conditional, granted by God only to those believers at the second coming of Christ. And apart from this divine bestowed gift, 
human beings are mortal. That is, that is why. Uh, anyway, I'll just go to the next, the next argument. They this belief also rest upon the belief in hell as a literal or a physical, tangible place. They argue that the biblical terms such as Sion in, in the, the Old Testament or Hades in the New Testament refer to, refer to a place, a physical location where the souls of the deceased continue to exist after death and that is the place where, where the ungodly are punished. However, a careful examination of these terms suggests otherwise. It suggests that both these terms actually refer to the grave or the realm of the dead, a state of unconsciousness until the resurrection of the resurrection. So the traditionalist understanding of eternal punishment as, uncon as conscious torment in hell is not supported by the teaching of the Bible. Now let us turn into the next viewpoint. Conditionalism. This conditionalism suggests that immortality or eternal life, sorry, eternal life is not inherently part of human nature, but it is a gift given by God to those who are saved through faith in Christ Jesus. And consequently, those who reject this God's offer of salvation will ultimately face destruction or annihilation. And based on our earlier evaluation of, if you remember the traditionalist understanding of eternal punishment in relation to immortal soul, this, this view actually aligns with the biblical teaching on the human nature. And, and we'll, we'll, pause, we'll pause on this topic, but we'll come back to it later and we'll jump into the next, the next um, viewpoint that is Universalism. Universalism takes a different stance by asserting that all people will ultimately be saved and reconciled to God. It emphasizes the universal redemption of all human beings, suggesting that eternal punishment serves as a corrective purpose that leads to the salvation of all people. However, when evaluated in light of the teaching of the Bible, it raises several concerns and it goes against the teaching of the Bible and I want to share three of them. First, it diminishes the human freedom and choice. You see, the Bible emphasizes the significance of human freedom and the ability to either choose or reject God's offer of salvation. But universalism, by suggesting that everyone will ultimately be saved regardless of the choice or rejection of God, actually undermines the importance of free will and the consequence of our decisions, which the Bible has placed a great emphasis on. The second problem with this view is that universalism also presupposes the existence of an immortal, immortal soul where individuals who didn't accept God's offer of salvation in their earthly life have another chance after death. And so, but the Bible didn't, does not teach this teaching. The Bible does not support because the Bible is teaching that the choices that we make during our lifetime carry eternal significance and that there is no provision for salvation beyond the grave. And the third concern with this view is that, you know, while universalism emphasizes God's love, it neglects the aspect of justice. The Bible teaches that God is both just and love and that sin must be punished and God's because God's justice demands that sin must be punished. And but, you know, this viewpoint only emphasizes the love aspect and it, it neglects the justice aspect. And by doing this, 
it undermines the seriousness of sin and also the need for repentance. So those are the three concerns with this view. Let's look at a brief, a brief exegetical study of Matthew 25, verse 46. I will summarize what I have, start, I have conducted. First, you know, the, let's look at the principle uh, set forth by Nicole. He said, the duration signified by Ionians must, in its case, be determined by the nature of the person or thing it describes. For example, so for example, when, by the way, this word is translated as, as eternal in this particular verse. So for example, when it applied to God, this word, an ionias, is mean, it means eternal or everlasting because God is timeless and without beginning or end. But when it applied to human beings, it has a more limited sense with a specific beginning and with a specific end or with a specific beginning with no end. And we will, we will, we will come to that later on. And so we follow this example, I mean this principle. And now let's us examine the context of Matthew 25 verse 46. And this is part of the parable of of sheep and goats, if you still remember. And in this parable, Jesus is contrasting the destinies of the righteous and the unrighteous using this very word, Ionias. And so it is obvious that when it applies to the righteous, this word refers to eternal or everlasting life. In other words, a word of life that has no end, even though it has a beginning. However, when it, it is applied to the wicked, it refers to a punishment that has an end. Why? Because in this, in this passage, Jesus is contrasting two destinies. And if the terms punishment and eternal, if the, puni if the terms punishment and life in this verse represent two contrasting a a destinies, it must mean that the punishment must be the opposite of life, right? The opposite of life that is a state of separation for life itself. In other words, this, the punishment here is the punishment of death that has an end or eternal death, if you will. And so based on my analysis, I adopted the, the conditionalist interpretation for the following reasons. First, because it reflects the, enten the intended meaning of the passage, that eternal punishment in Matthew 25, verse 46, refers to eternal death, emphasizing the cessation or absence of life. Second, it affirms the biblical portrayal of death as unconsciousness. And third, it embraces holistic biblical anthropology. And fourth, it anticipates the vision of a future without sin and suffering. And fifth, it supports the biblical teaching on immortality. And sixth, it emphasizes Christ as the only way to immortality or eternal life. And seven, it is consistent with God's nature or God's character, both that God is a loving God as well as a just, a just God. And I want to leave with this thought that Ultimately, the pursuit of understanding the concept of eternal punishment must, must lead us to a deeper appreciation of God's character and his redemptive purpose for humanity. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for presenting about the debate on eternal punishment in Matthew 25 verse 46. Let's come to the Q&A session. And uh, who among you here have eternal punishing questions? <laughs> okay, let's... Uh... Okay, Pastor Dumakmat.
Yes. Whereas the second one is, is eternal without end because, because it applies to the righteous. Did you consider also the word punishment? Because it's not eternal punishing, but eternal punishment. So the punishment is eternal in its nature. Uh, because of the limitation of the research, I did not emphasize on the punishment itself. Because my 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 original purpose is to examine the various interpretations that have emerged in, in response to this particular concept. So I did not do focus on the, the exegesis on the, this word punishment. So sorry. I think that's an eternal punishing question. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, follow up questions? Maybe the Pastor Domokmat is uh, suggesting to include yeah, include that in, in exegetical uh, research or investigation. Okay, for, for, for. Why don't you look also of the how many times the word Ayunius appears in the, in the Gospel of Matthew because, so that the interpretation will be from context and then what are the interpretations that is speak that's not eternal really and these are the passages that is that speak that it's really eternal that might help further uh, because i i think the when i look at the presentation you presented three already debates right and it seems to be that that uh, uh, you have been influenced your interpretation of matthew had been influenced by, by those one of these three. That's why you, you, it's conditioni conditionalism. That's why the interpretation is like this. But I'm, I appreciate so much big, uh, when you pointed out on the immortality of the soul as the basis for the traditionalism and the universalism is, uh, interpretation. That's really correct. Thank you for your comment. OK, one more. Oh, OK, Pastor Indriga. I use it uh, as a synonym for each other in this presentation. So in, in, I asked my, one of my prof professors in the AIU, and he told me that conditionalism is actually the, the view before the fall, and annihilationism is the view after the fall. After the fall. Yes. In other words, conditionalism is you, Adam and Eve, they have this inherent immortality, but that is condition. As the condition is as long as they obey God, they will have this immortality. But annihilationism is focusing on the negative side. If you don't have, or if you don't accept God's offer of salvation, you will be annihilated or completely destroyed and do not exist anymore. I don't know if that answers your question. Adventist, we are uh, synony I think it's synonyms, yeah, conditionalism and annihilationism. And we are, our position is on this view conditionalism, all or slash annihilationism. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Pastor Dal Zerkop. Oh, Pastor. <laughs> Yes, I will, let me give, uh, give me a few minutes. I include some here in the slides. Yes, for example, if you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it highlights actually the initial condition of Im humanity. In other words, the immortality that is promised is conditional as long as they believe or they obey God. And the second verse is John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, there, we know the verse, very well-known verse, and the contrasting terms, perish and eternal life, suggest that those who, don't, who do not believe 
Jesus Christ will face destruction or annihilation rather than and the third one is you know, Romans chapter 6 verse 23 again there is a contrast between death and life and so life if life is a gift for the, the or the reward of the, the righteous then death must be the reward or the punishment of the wicked there are more biblical passages but I did not include Yes, uh, very thank you.